once again, we have not had a E3 this year. Instead, we have had a Key 3. Um, but let me back up a bit. Uh, since I started doing Nintendo Power Retrospectives and breaking it all down and all of that, every I started that around a, a past E3. Um, and since then, um, well, I've decided that, um, uh, like, sort of had thought of E3 as my anniversary for the channel. And so when E3 comes around, I do a special video doing a roundup of the stuff that I've seen at my car on coverage at home that has caught my interest and that I'm looking forward to in the year to come. Um, now, over the course of the pandemic, we haven't had an in-person E3. Instead, we've had Jeff Keighley's Summer Games Fest, or, has his or as it has colloquially been, anno been known as Key 3. Various a showcase of various um, games through the Summer Games Fest event stream itself, along with various other ancillary streams going on around it, some from console manufacturers like uh, Sony and Microsoft, some from publishers like Square Enix, uh, some from just standalone people like the PC Gamer Showcase, along with demos being available through like the Steam Next Fest and on the Xbox Store store and all sorts of other stuff all and this year everything ran basically all the way to the end of june so consequently i made an executive decision on my part to hold off from being strictly topical and doing it all around the same time as e3 and instead wait until the end of the month to go over everything and just wait and have that be my cutoff point for all right after this th this is the stuff that is the that is the key th that counts in my book as key three. I will then go over it on my own time and see what catches my interest and share it. And so here are my 10 picks. And as always with all of my lists, these are in no particular order. Any of these work, or, 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 I'll, all of these catch my interest, all to various degrees. I'm not ranking it. I'm just limiting it to 10 just for the sake of, sake of scope. I will endeavor to have up in this area over here, uh, the trailer is for the games in question and a picture in picture mode. Number 10, Tactical Breach Wizards for the PC, at least at this point. Uh, I actually, I'm, I'm going to hold off on mentioning the names of consoles with a couple exceptions where these are being launched just because cards subject to change, so to speak. Um, some of these games, they were exclusive to a particular console at the start of the month when they were initially announced. And then later on over the course of the month, they have more and more consoles became available. So tactical breach wizards looks like a game that takes the tactical turn-based gameplay of combat in titles like the X, like the shadow run trilogy, as well as XCOM one and two in particular tightens the level of the giant designed to be in more modest confined chunks and intersperse some story content that has some really fun, charming, and kind of punchy dialogue. Now, the game, as of this recording, has only been announced for the PC so far, um, but also but the way the game is set up feels like it was something that would do incredibly well on the Switch, particularly considering the size of the levels that we see shown in the trailer. Now, there could be more expansive and involved levels in the final release of the game. This is The game itself is just in beta, but, you know, the point still stands. And so also I like I love I really like the dialogue. I like like these dialogue choices that we see in the trailer where it's like a variety of three different quips, all of which basically mean the same thing or have the same intent behind them. Um, but it depends on which 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 is the kind of witty that you feel like today. And I hope that in the final version of the game that that sets the tone that that tone is kept, I should say. Um, from what we see in this trailer. Number nine, the Persona 3 through 5 multi-platform release. So I was watching the Bethesda game showcase and I saw the Atlas logo show up. And I'm like, huh, first thought. I wonder if Devil Summoners, the new Devil Summoner game is coming to the Xbox. Then I saw the butterfly come up on screen, which is something from the Persona series. And I went, hmm, I wonder if we're going to get a port of... Persona 4 Golden, Golden ah, Persona, Persona 4 Golden or Persona 5 Royale. Instead, the former game is on PC and the latter game already runs on last and current gen consoles. If you're noticing how 
quickly the cuts are in the, between these images on the trailer, you would understand like, oh, this is like my, my, my brain's going pretty crack fast here. Because then burn my dread hit and my mind was blown and I spent the rest of the day cleaning bits of my own skull out of the keyboard. I don't recommend that. It's a real pain, particularly with mechanical keyboards. It's no fun. Don't do it. Try to avoid that situation if you can at all possible. And then at the end of June, we'd gotten a couple of announcements that, oh yeah, some of these are also coming to um, PS4 and PS5, uh, Persona 3 and 4. Um, we're going to become there, which makes sense. Both of those games have been released on PSP and Vita. It fits somewhat with their backwards compatible initiative, more or less. Then, at the end of June, in the Nintendo Direct Partner video, we learned that all three of those games are coming to the Switch. Which, again, this is kind of the point where, I'm, okay, I should definitely just stretch my definition of Key 3 for the whole month. This is basically like, this is the majority of the Persona series. Um, all we're really missing here are um, the PSP versions of Persona, Persona 2 Innocent Sin, and both of which got a US release on PSP, and Persona 2 Eternal Punishment, which we did not get on PSP. We did get the um, PlayStation 1 version, original PlayStation version on um, Switch, and on oh, Switch, on um, uh, PlayStation 3 and PSP through download, but we can just get those three Let's get the entirety of um, the Persona series on here. Hell, even if we got If tossed in there as well, so my tent say If, I would be tremendously happy. I mean, hell, Persona 2 and Eternal Punishment for the PSP hasn't even gotten a fan translation yet. Sheesh. Now, number eight, speaking of compilations and such, the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. As part of the same, same Nintendo showcase, one of the games that was shown was a collection of Mega Man Battle Network games as part of the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. I am of an age where the Battle Network series was coming out as I was in like early high school, kind of contemporaneously with some of, some of the mid the PSP Pokemon games, that sort of thing. And if I had, and I had a, a GBA at the time, had the cash to actually afford the games, I would have all been all for it. But getting games was pretty rare for me at the time. Often, the times a lot of the games I was getting were like a generation or so back, or my PlayStation One, or playing backwards compatible on my um, yeah, yeah my PlayStation One, or that sort of thing. Because I could stretch my dollar more. I could, I could get spend forty, fifty bucks or so on a. GBA game, or I spend 20 bucks and get Final Fantasy 7 and 8 um, used, or that sort of thing. Or like 20 bucks or less for this sort of stuff. So, the same reason I never really got into Pokemon the same way that some of my peers did. Now, having the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection provides a way, it provides a way for me to experience those games and hopefully in the way that they get a level of quality of life overhauls that later that the earlier Mega Man releases, the earlier Mega Man legacy collections on Switch and PC and that sort of thing also received, like rewinds, that sort of thing, because Battle Network is a more active sort of RPG in a way that Pokemon isn't. So I'm interested very much in seeing that. Sure to mention here, number seven, Ground Divers. Um, Ground Divers looks like the Mr. Digger clone I never knew I wanted. It has like a level of progression and escalation, not an escalation, but a level of progression to it in a sort of RPG sense and a narrative that the Mr. Digger games themselves don't necessarily have because they're those ones are just more generally strictly arcade based. And so I like the combination of the two here. So I am hyped for that. Number six, Gungrave Gore. Gungrave was a fun, flawed but fun launch title for the PS2 with style and spades helped by character designer Net Yasuhiro Naito. And I dug the game. I also dug the anime. And I was always like, always kind of like, why didn't we ever come back to this in a form? Not on the PlayStation 3, not on the PlayStation 4. Well, we're coming back to it now. 
and it's taking the designs and just sticking it in, in Ultra HD on modern consoles. And it still feels like it makes those designs work, which is not what I expected. Um, it's like if we got an Ultra HD version of Getter Robo, but not like not like cell shaded or that sort of thing, like like realistic feeling character design, like very much more realistic feeling character designs, but still that level of edge that you'd expect from something like Getter Robo. I I I, I kind of love it. I'm I'm here for that a lot. Number five, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. Now, I had a PSP also, and I really loved playing Crisis Core on it, and I was always bummed that it didn't wasn't available digitally, so when I switched to the Vita, particularly if my PSP started having problems with the battery and me having some different and the battery and the latches there too. Um I basically decided, yeah, this isn't work. Like, I'm not going to say this isn't working for me, but it's, I didn't want to have to then hunt down a additional used PSP and that sort of thing, variety of stuff. I could probably, I could probably strap things together, but on my end, but I, it was at a point where like, okay, my, like the, I replaced the battery, but the door latch wasn't staying on. And I had to duct, using duct tape to hold it on. And it wasn't, wasn't great. So, and I simply mean to play it an emulator like I've been doing for uh, Tactics Ogre. But anyway, then the announcement came around in Square Enix Showcase that the game was getting an HD remaster for modern consoles, including the Switch. And honestly, when we got the Switch, that's kind of what I wanted for the, the Switch in general, is this is a system that would do the things that I kind of always wanted. Like, let me play PSP and Vita games if they got ported over, remastered, the way I've wanted to play them. Tactics, stuff like Tactics Ogre, um, or Final Fantasy Tactics, or Crisis Core, and that sort of thing. Being able to play it handheld on the go, and then hook it up to the television once I got home, and play it that way. It's the, the promise of cross faring as they called it, as well. Um, and so now if only Square would just learn from this for Final Fantasy Tactics. I've heard rumors for Tactics Ogre as well, but that's only just on the Sony side. If we got something similar like for, for a lot of these games. Um, again, Final Fantasy Tactics, La Pousse, oh, La was uh, PS2, but um, Agenda Arc or that sort of thing. That would be like a lot of those PSP and Vita games would be great both ways. Um, Stranger Sword City is available that way too, and that's that's that feels and like a fun and good way to play that kind of dungeon crawler. Uh, number four, Demon School. Demon School is a game that feels like as a classic Persona Five, as is Persona One and Two, but also with a bunch of going to guy and Kenny Shikawa visual flair. Flair, one of the male characters in the trailers, has the um, well, I've heard her colloquially referred to as Nagai Burns. Um, and this is kind of very heavy like, the edge to come with the fact that this is in a demon school and we're dealing with a lot of demon characters, but it's also not as, for lack of a better term, horny on main as going a guy gets to, um, more or less by default, which in turn can make for a tremendously fun game. Now this game could still stumble into a field of rakes, but what I've seen so far looks great. Speaking of JRPGs or JRPG inspired games, number three, RPG Time, The Legend of Right. This is the second of three titles that were announced at Nintendo Partners Direct that really grabbed me. Uh, this is a JRPG inspired game that is done in the um, in the style of a kid's notebook doodle, school notebook doodles kind of thing. Drawn to Death did this too, but Drawn to Death was edgelord as hell. And this instead looks charming as opposed to crash, crass and obnoxious. Now, we don't have examples of the game's actual mechanics in, in action necessarily, so I think it's still end up being clunky. The narrative presentation looks fun and interesting, and I'd like to see more. Number two, Final Fan... Um, let me combine one here of Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two and um, Final Fantasy XVI. I'm already planning to get set, uh, remake, uh, Seven Remake Part Two. I beat Seven remake part one and I enjoyed it immensely and I'm so I was like okay 
I'm here for where this story is going, and I'm looking forward to see what, what we get. The bits with the opening in the trailer showing Cloud and Sephiroth talking, I mean, walking and talking, I appreciate. I'm glad we're continuing with that aspect of the story. I was concerned with how the last game wrapped that we just, that we just get left there. But that's not the case, and I'm glad to see that. Final Fantasy 16 looks much more action-based. Um, we haven't seen much of the party system as yet, or how parties will interact, whether it'll be giving characters orders, or um, whether it's going to be something like 15 with how that party system worked, or if this was something new entirely. There's a bunch of ways this could go. I like some of the presentation. There's definitely more to see here. I like what they're doing with the summons in this game. The way that Final Fantasy 15 handled the scale of the summons was amazing and how to work. And I appreciate how they worked into the story. I like how they're working in here too. Summons in Final Fantasy work best when they have a fundamental narrative link to the story. Um, I like, like in some manner or another, um, like seven was fine. Like I, I or seven original seven was good. I enjoyed it, but I uh, but like six handled the sun five or four, six, uh, eight, not eight, like eight onwards, more or less handled the summons better in various extents. Um, I haven't gotten too much in <clears throat> played enough into 13 to quite see how the 13 handles the summons, but like, if you're, but when you have beings with that level of cosmic power and force, it's, I appreciate when it is incorporated into the game's narrative in some degree or another. So we'll see how those, how, how that pans out with further developments, but otherwise, I'm in. I'm here for it. Honorable mentions. Uh, Captain Velvet Meteor, the jump dimensions. It looks interesting with gameplay mechanics seem to be focused around team up moves and like quickly clearing out monsters and that sort of thing with a narrative based around a kid moving to a new town and having difficulty fitting in or making friends and falling and using as a coping mechanism, this imaginary world where he's interacting with characters from, uh, jump plus manga. Um, I would like to see more in the finished project and how it, how the narrative articulates with the various characters. Also, um, minor strike against it to my end. You have Lloyd Forger in the game, just Lloyd, no, your, and also no, um, like no Anya reaction faces. One of the great things about spy family is Anya reacting to stuff. You don't got that. That's a fail. Now there's a chance that we'll get that later, but currently but that's a bit of a fail. Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis. This was one of the big other big announcements from the same Final Fantasy Square Enix event that got us um, the Crisis Core remaster and release date for Remake Mark II. Uh, it looks interesting. I like the concept of taking all of the compilation of Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy VII games, including Final Fantasy VII and even Crisis Core, and adapting them into a into a more turn-based RPG for mobile, um, and trying to do things in somewhat reasonable chunks and that sort of thing. It looks interesting. I like the turn-based combat. I like how it articulates in a way similar to how the turn-based combat in Final Fantasy VII on the PlayStation did, where stylized characters in the overworld map, perhaps even in cutscenes, and then more realistic designs in actual combat. And this could be particularly interesting with stuff that didn't use turn-based combat in the first place, like Dirge of Cerberus. But this is a mobile game, so the question becomes how the microtransactions pan out with that. On top of Square Enix talking about narrative-focused NFTs, bleh. but even in that case, I would hope they would, for the narrative-focused NFT thing, I would hope, fingers crossed, knock on wood, um, that if they were to do that, they wouldn't do that on a Final Fantasy-related project. Let's see. Uh, Dragon's Dogma. I've enjoyed 
playing my time spent with Dragon's Dogma uh, Dark Arisen and before Dark Arisen came out. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about the second game. But currently what we have so far is Dragon's Dogma 2 exists. That's wonderful. There's a Dragon's Dogma MMO 2. We never got it here in the US. So saying, hey, Dragon's Dogma 2 exists. That's great. If it doesn't come out here, then that just leaves me going, sitting here all grumpy, all grumpy face going. And finally, let's get to number one. Doraemon, Story of Seasons. I'll admit that farm simulator games like Harvest Moon had never necessarily grabbed me when I first read about them on new game websites or in magazines on their own. And then I played the first Harvest Moon for Nintendo Power Perspectives, and I got it. I understood the appeal, but I also found frustration with how the game Harvest Moon 1 put such heavy emphasis on time management and even to really like super precise routing in order to get done the things you need to get done so you can have the money and stuff you need to do to progress other parts of the story and advanced character relationships and that sort of thing. Now, some other games like maybe Stardew Valley won't have this problem as much, but we'll see. Hopefully, Doraemon, because it's got that license, well, Doraemon Story of Seasons, because it has that Doraemon license attached, will go, will take a step back and go, okay, this is Doraemon, this is a Story of Seasons game, but it's also a Doraemon game. It's made for kids. We're gonna chill a bit when it comes to heavy, to laying the time management stuff thick on this for you. And instead have it be, okay, semi-real-time clock to get things done within reasonable chunks of time to, okay, you have a day and the time moves forward in time increments and you control when time increments forward at each area you're at, like moving between areas increments the clock forward a degree or something like that to give you time to walk around and talk to everybody, to pick all your vegetables and put them in the thing and just kind of to do or to pet, to pet the cows, to pet the horse, you know, the cows to uh, collect the eggs from the chickens, all uh, this, that, and the other thing, that sort of stuff. So, and particularly actually with all of Doraemon's gadgets involved, also providing a degree of quality of life improvements where you don't have to worry as much about, um, bringing in money for the vegetables and for what vegetables you pick um, or choose they choose to grow and then pick and then put more focus on growing vegetable on what growing what vegetables you want to grow and that sort of thing and, and have it be have it be less related to this um, growing turnips will get you uh, more money to start and more on oh these people in town want are looking for these vegetables for that sort of thing and growing vegetables to progress a narrative with that character. That that would be fun. And for there's probably other quality of life improvements there too, as well. Um, really all related to Doraemon's gadgets, because those are brought up in the trailer. We'll see if those come up within reasonable limits, of course. So those are my top 10 picks from Key 3. No real shame of the show. Um, the one thing I do appreciate with this style presentation is the games that are like you don't get necessarily get the the Blackwater the motion based light gun game anymore, or at least not for stuff like this. Um, those games come out, but those like they don't they come out on their own time now these days. Uh, like the Twitch chat during some of the streams was dire, as far, um, but that's a problem with. That's a problem with any Twitch chat when you like for like something for, like the Sony Twitch chat or the Square Twitch chat or the PC Gamer Twitch chat. If you're in a, if you're watching a restream on a side community or that sort of thing, like for Next Lander or Loading Ready Run or all this, that, and the other thing, it tends to be more self-selected and smaller and you and things are generally more under control. So otherwise. Uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed what I got a chance to watch. Um, let me know what caught your interest. Um, what 
what are, are you interested in picking up and playing that I didn't mention? In particular, I didn't really get to dive that much into the Steam Next Fest. So if there are games that you got to play the demos of during the Next Fest that you think are going to be great, are going to be fun, uh, absolutely let me know in the comments. I would love to keep, know what, what you found was cool so I can keep an eye out and pick those up later and play them on my own. Maybe even stream them at some point in the future as well. Uh, in the meantime, thank you all very much for watching. I'll catch you next, catch you later. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.